he needed control over females, and he loved ropes because they were very sexual to him. He needed them to be bound because that had been the part of his arousal since he first felt any kind of sexual feelings. There would have been a lot more victims if things had worked out. Raider had a notion about himself, and still does, that he was a good guy, essentially, who did some bad things. To his mind, that meant he was helpful to neighbors, he was a good father, a good husband, a good provider. Um, he did the right things as a citizen of his town and state. He was a, a hardworking member of his church. Occasionally, he had forays into his dark side where he would stalk people, break into their houses, and kill them. But that, those were, in his mind, aberrations. They were not really who he was. But if you really look at the way he describes any of those incidents, they really define where he believed his life was most exciting and most expressive of who he was. Someone like a serial killer, especially a predatory one, they developed that secret life because it feels hot to them. It where they're alive. It's where they spend a lot of time in fantasy and it becomes more real to them than the routines of their real life, to the point where you can have different sets of morality for each of those points of view. It's really the ability to shift in and out, or as Rader says, live on the face of the cube and do what's needed for today. The cubing is what psychologists might call compartmentalizing or partitioning. So if you take a cube and it has all these multiple sides, he was all those sides too, but whatever face he had turned to you is what he was at that time. They're very present focused. They're, they're very able to be in this world right now without thinking about the implications in the other world because there's nothing really at stake except what you want. Dennis Rader, unlike most serial killers, used role models. He started as a teenager to become fascinated with with true detective magazines. And one of the early ones featured photographs of models who'd been tied up by a serial killer named Harvey Glattman. And because they'd been bound with rope, which was a sexual fetish that was developing for Raider at the time, um, this caught his attention. That image seared itself into Raider's mind. He needed control over females, and he loved ropes because they were very sexual to him. He needed them to be bound because that had been the part of his arousal since he first felt any kind of sexual feelings. If something is very arousing and makes you feel alive, that thing is, you're going to want to repeat that over and over in more and more intense situations. And then the killing, in part was to eliminate witnesses. Initially, Raider's stalking came from when he was in the military because he imagined himself to be a spy. He had a whole fantasy around being sort of a James Bond type of character. So he would go look in people's houses and think about what he would do to women that he saw. And then when he came back to Wichita, he'd walk around in people's backyards. And it made him feel very powerful that he could see into their houses 
and kind of own them in a way while they're completely oblivious of him outside. And that led to him breaking into people's homes. He could take anything he wanted or do anything he wanted to them. I think he definitely had an attitude of your specialness, your destiny. Narcissistic immunity, it's like a, like a shell around you or a womb around you. And uh, I think he just believed that he had picked the right victim and once he knows this is gonna happen, there's really no stopping. What Raider says about the down times or the slow times is he was out stalking. He was always looking for the perfect victim or the, you know somebody who he might target. He sent me a list of 55 potential projects that he stalked, that he knew all kinds of details about, that he had put nicknames on, that he had dates for, whose homes he had broken into. Had they come home, they would have been dead. So there certainly would have been a lot more victims if things had worked out. Ritter has called himself a narcissist, but it's funny because it depends on which side of the cube he's on when you ask him a question. So if you wanted to ask him if he, you know, prayed and believed in God, if he was in the mood to say yes, then he would. But there would be days where he'd like, that doesn't matter to me. Personally, I think psychopaths lie all the time, so a self-assessment is pretty worthless. I remember one of my questions was, has anyone ever said anything bad about you? And he said, no. I said, well, what are you talking about? At the hearing, the victim's families, I mean, at the very least. If my focus were hatred, I would stare you down and call you a demon from hell who defiles this court at the very sight of its cancerous presence. People have said some bad things about you. He said, I'm talking about today. <laughs> Whatever serves his purpose. So he's not gonna be thinking about the horrible things people have said about him because, because his life started over today, in his mind, on that side of the cube. So whatever question you might ask him, you might get an answer depending on the impression he wants to leave on you today.